Hello, it's Brad Laurie of Blockchain Brad. And today we're speaking about all things Manta Network. And to do that, we have the COO in the hot seat to explain all things about Manta. Thank you very much, Kenny Lee, for being here. Thank you for having me, Brad. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. And in the name of transparency, it's essential that you know this is entirely free. And most importantly, I am not invested in anything related to Manta Network, but I will tell you this. I've had pre-discussions with Kenny, and I also certainly want to be involved more in that aspect of investment for the future because I am seeing value here personally. Not, if not financial advice, but let's get stuck into what matters, and that's information from the source. Now, Kenny, as a co-founder, again, thank you for making time to allow us all to have insights into what Manta are doing. I am a fan of legit tech. Many people know that. I truly believe you're one of those people who are representing that kind of mindset and evidence in the blockchain. Let's start though with the question of privacy. Now you argue, uh, or I guess the team um, put forward the idea and premise that you are the first privacy protocol built for interoperability, privacy, and scalability on Polkadot. So do you want, that's a mouthful, do you want to break any of these parts down to clarify, I guess, in a nutshell, in an overview, essentially what you stand for as a team? Yeah, so um, I think two things that stand out. The first is a privacy protocol, and the second one is Polkadot. And I guess that that kind of layers in interoperability as well. So I'll, I'll take it on two parts. Um, so the first part about the privacy protocol, and uh, I think it just kind of goes back to where are we in the blockchain space today? Um, you know, when you're looking at whether it's Bitcoin or a Turing complete network like Ethereum, um, the question is like, is there privacy? And I, I would say that a lot of people assume that there's some layer of privacy there, but honestly, um, it's like Reddit. You have a username, you, you subscribe to subreddits, you do posts. But as soon as someone figures out what your Reddit username is, then you're no longer private. And it's kind of the same way on blockchain, right? Like you've got wallet addresses, more likely more than one, but some people may only have one. Um, but as soon as people link those wallet addresses to your identity, then you're no longer private. So privacy really is an issue. Um, people don't really recognize how big of an issue it is. But when we did a survey recently of around 400 respondents in the space, we realized that 75% of them are actually changing their behavior just to address uh, the privacy issue when they're making potential transactions to other users. These 75% of people uh, or respondents have either hesitated or altogether avoided making that transaction in the past. So from our perspective, we see privacy as a really big problem, um, not just in DeFi, but the blockchain space in general, right? And, and we see a world five to 10 years from now where either blockchain will be extremely scalable B2B use cases and privacy needs to be in there, or there's just no blockchain growth at all. Um, right. So at the end of the day, privacy is very important. Um, but we're building a privacy protocol. And so I do want to kind of distinguish that from what exists today, right? There are like the Zcashes of the world, the Dashes, the Moneros. And uh, where we're a little bit different is kind of focused on that interoperability aspect, which gets into the second point. And um, what we describe it as is a bring your own token model. So instead of using our native token, uh, users can bring in DOT, for example, and mint private versions of their DOT and transact those private versions. And so that private transaction keeps their identity and the amount obfuscated the entire time. Mm -hmm. So in that case, right, like we're, we're delivering privacy without having to ask users to uh, conform to our specific standards. They're, they're able to be flexible in exactly how they choose to use our network. And then I guess the, the last part kind of going into uh, interoperability and Polkadot, we are building on substrate. And so we will be interoperable with the Polkadot ecosystem once we secure a parachain later on this year. Okay, well, that's confident because obviously the parachain is the, is a hot topic right now among all those following the Polkadot ecosystem. And as Dan Reese has said, you know, if you're not a parachain at some point, you're not really involved in 
Polkadot itself. And that's a controversial statement, but you want to be in line for those parachains, no question. Now let's move back a bit to some of these things. Now, obviously privacy from all the educators, all of the researchers who've been involved in blockchain, we all know privacy has been at the forefront of the agenda from the outset. Um, but there was also the question of anonymity and the, the value or how it was valorized from the outset of, you know, since the first iteration of Bitcoin. There is a distinction though clearly between anonymity, the goals inherent in that, and then uh, privacy as you've alluded to. So can we just talk about that for a moment, the difference between the two agenda and why you've chosen privacy, why that matters. Let's really push this forward so people understand the distinction here. Uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I... I think just to kind of preface this, right, like I have my own sort of opinion on the difference between privacy and anonymity. Uh, so please, Brad, feel free to interject at any point in time and include yours as well. Um, but my understanding with privacy is that, you know, privacy is, I guess, for lack of a better term, and depending on where you are, it's it's a fundamental human right, right? And and it really is uh, or has existed quite well until recently, I guess, the internet age, right? There's there's a lot of that lack of privacy these days. But um, what we're fighting for is that privacy aspect. But when it really comes down to it, uh, what what you should really distinguish from privacy is that it doesn't imply that this allows illicit activity, bad actors to be involved, right? Because privacy just means that you should be able to do what you are doing without having to worry about someone else coming in and viewing uh, your activity on a public chain. Because, you know, maybe you make one transaction, that's one data point. Five years later, you've made 5,000 transactions. That's 5,000 data points. People are building online profiles about you. And this is only going to get bigger and bigger as blockchain continues to scale and transactions are continuing to be transparent, right? So, so for people like you and me, right, we, we just want to make our transactions without having to worry about some unauthorized party exploiting our data for one reason or another. And so that's, that's really a lot of the privacy concern here. And if you think about it from like a B2B level, right, um, trade secrets, a company trying to source parts from other parts of the world, and they're negotiating prices, uh, and they're also buying parts from certain companies, and those companies have their wallet addresses. And so if you're able to link those directly on chain in a public manner, then the trade secrets are at risk, right? And that, that is fundamental to a business's survival. So from that perspective as well, right, um, privacy is a huge concern. Anonymity, on the other hand, the way that I think of anonymity is trying to avoid um, detection. Uh, and that may not necessarily be for a, a good use case. Uh, you know, there, there are bad actors in the world as well. And so I think the, the distinguishment here is that we, we do want to preserve privacy, uh, but the entirety of anonymity to enforce some type of uh, motivation for bad actors isn't necessarily what we're going for. I think you've articulated it perfectly. And I think a lot of people do agree with you sincerely. Um, I can only speak, you know, obviously of my own subjective position, but just to reiterate what you're saying, clearly we, if we look at the legacy models of finance, for example, and um, we look at the, I guess, participants in finance the world over as users, uh, as clients, the evidence is all there empirically that privacy does matter. And I think that's why it's so interesting to see this progress into the blockchain, into the DeFi space. Now we see uh, Polkadot leading uh, the potentials of DeFi as well with regard to their layer zero network and design. And so it harks back to, I guess, that positive coloring of privacy as opposed to all the things we've seen in the past, where there are those genuine anonymity uh, related risks in terms of firstly, there was a misconception a mis misconception that, uh, you know, initially that the blockchain was anonymous, which it is not. And so as a result, it's even more reason why perhaps we do need these privacy protocols. And what's interesting also, and this is to the next point, Kenny, is that you're not just a protocol itself you're also a platform. And this is where it's interesting where there'll be other um, uh, different layer layer one blockchains, for example, being able to interact with you. There'll be able to app applications being able to interact with you. So this is where it really starts to become a secret source, I think for Manta, in that you are not just simply this layer one architecture, but you're enfranchising the interactivity and interoperability of several, and not even just in the Polkadot ecosystem itself. So do you wanna to touch on that as well now, uh, how you differentiate in that respect? 
Yeah. So thank you for bringing up that point, Brad. Um, and I guess, I guess I can't go into too much detail about our thinking and strategy on the polka dot side, but at the end of the day, right? Like we believe that privacy is essential for scalable blockchain use cases today and in the future. D, uh, NFTs, DeFi, um, DAOs, right? Like all of these do need some type of privacy. And the thing is like, not all these projects have privacy experts, cryptographers, people who know zero knowledge proofs. And so what the, the question boils down to should those projects have to hire their own in-house cryptography team to make sure that they can build that privacy preservation layer? Or is there something that they can use in order to just plug in and add that privacy preservation layer, like a, almost like a SaaS bottle, right? Where you don't have to worry about building everything from scratch because there's a service already there for you to plug into. And then all you have to do is customize it a little. Like instead of building uh, a website from HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you can just use Wix or Squarespace. You know, not endorsing them, just kind of putting them out as examples. Um, and so that's where we really want to be. We want to be that plug and play layer because we believe that every project, regardless of what their value proposition is, I, I mean, I guess, unless their value proposition is to be fully public and transparent, um, there, there is a use case for that privacy layer. And we don't, we don't see a world that's scalable where every project has to go and find their own experts in order to build that out. And so we want to make it easy for all these projects. And that's why it's so key and such a, an advantage to be in the Polkadot ecosystem, because we're, we're interoperable with parachain projects uh, on day one. Right. And so, well, let's go. Let's keep going with this. So, as you know, roughly around 100 parachains are the initial plan over time, and we're seeing the emergence of these come through very soon. And and obviously, uh, in the coming months and, and years ahead, there'll be more uh, information, I guess, about each of these parachains. And each of them seems to also be a specialty or a niche market of their own. Now, what's interesting is that you may have a, a first mo market mover advantage or first mover advantage rather with respect to the polka dot system. So I want to talk about that because that could be a differentiator for you as well, quite sincerely, uh, in the context of privacy. And when you talk about plug and play, you know, for those imagining, literally, we can start to see this literally could be a great analogy, even where you, you're plugging into other layer one blockchains. And obviously, the parachains are those layer ones, and you yourself are designed in that same layer one arena. And so you haven't built on top of others, that sets you apart. So once again, it really could be a case where you're the first of, of many perhaps to come who may try this to become a plug and play for a whole and replete uh, blockchain architecture and full stack. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think we're, we're seeing this with a lot of uh, parachain projects right now. And I, I think Polkadot's catching on to this as well, which is why they've kind of, or not kind of, they've announced uh, the, the public good chains right? The, the chains that could become parachains without necessarily needing to go through the auction process because they're, they're some type of commodity that should be usable, uh, plug and playable mm. by, by uh, all the projects in the ecosystem. So that should also be accelerate your use case and your application and your interaction with some of these. If they're not all having to go through the rigor of the parachains directly, surely you can also benefit from the future of Polkadot in this respect. Um, sorry, what do you mean by the, the rigor? So, so in terms of the rigor of, of just simply establishing your own privacy protocols, for example, that's rigorous, that's onerous, that's detailed, you know, you're leading this out. And so in risk with respect to, you mentioned that in the future, or even alluded to some of the polka dot startups that exist today may not have to go through the rigor of the parachain process through the auction process, for example, and still be acknowledged within the Polkadot ecosystem. Surely, because you're a plug and play privacy protocol, you should be able to connect with some of those parties that aren't necessarily going through that same rigor, but will still be within the scope and value of the Polkadot ecosystem and Kasama as well. Yeah. So if those projects become public goods projects, then they don't necessarily have to go through the parachain auction to actually be secured as a parachain. And then alternatively, right, there's para threads as well. So mm -hmm. projects that can coexist in the ecosystem without having to have a parachain. 
Um, and our goal is to be inter interoperable across pair of chains as well as pair of threads. Yeah, and that's where I was going because we'll still see the emergence. And a lot of people aren't talking about parent threads yet, but they will, I think, in time as more of this, uh, I guess, architecture unfolds and the public become more aware. Now, obviously, the, prob the problem of privacy, we've discussed that. Um, there's generally a lack of interoperability across the board of DeFi. So I want to talk about DeFi now because it's clear that Polkadot is a valid uh, place and home for DeFi. We've established that technologically this year very clearly. Uh, but what are your thoughts on DeFi more generally? And are you going to be working with other blockchains um, outside of the scope of Polkadot, um, given I would assume you're agnostic? Yeah, so um, I, I think I'll take, so there's two parts to that question. The first part is what is my thought on DeFi? And the second part is, uh, are we going to be expanding outside of the Polkadot ecosystem to be working with other projects? Right. Um, I, and I'll take it last backwards. So um, the, the question about uh, our involvement with other projects. So we do want to be involved with other projects uh, outside of the Polkadot ecosystem. The way that we see this happening the quickest, um, I guess fastest, quickest, um, is through the uh, through the bridge projects that are already occurring on Polkadot as we speak, right? Like the the uh, plasms of the world, the moonbeams, the uh, the clovers, uh, and so much like they probably don't want to reinvent the the privacy wheel, we don't necessarily want to reinvent the ERC-20 bridge wheel because they're already doing it. And so it are, for, for, for example, Ethereum projects, right? How do we interact with them? We definitely want to leverage the parachain projects that are already building those bridges to, to uh, I guess, work with those projects in the future. And um, my gut feeling uh, and kind of gut, kind of, you know, some insider knowledge is uh, you know, ERC-20 isn't the last bridge that's going to be built, right? There's going to be bridges to a lot of other projects. And we're honestly really excited to see all this interoperability come into play. Um, the DeFi space, what do I think about it? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Anything specific? <laughs> well, let, let's talk specifically about privacy, I suppose, because that would be interesting to juxtapose the two. How, where do you see the, the conversation narrative of privacy sit within the scope of other blockchain startups, with, especially with layer ones, obviously, um, with regard to what they're doing um, with DeFi privacy? Yeah, so a lot, of the, a lot of the privacy questions around DeFi that we're seeing with, when we speak with, I guess, colloquial whales um, or like institutions, funds, uh, are two aspects. One is liquidity providing, and two is actual movement of their assets. So um, when these types of players are moving their assets, right, it's almost like golden shackles in the sense that the entire community is watching you. The altcoin community is watching your movements. And so if they see you making some type of movement, whatever it may be, and for whatever reason, no one knows, but a lot of people will speculate. And that speculation can cause a lot of issues um, with the community. And so, you know, I, I mean, you know, community is definitely not the only thing that matters in a project, but when you've got this community kind of confused, um, anxious, right? Like there can, there can be quite a few problems that subsequently affect that asset. Mm. And so um, a lot of these, a lot of these, I guess, large asset token holders, they end up not having to be able to move or, or at least not a lot at once. And so this has kind of been a problem for them. Uh, and they're really excited about a privacy protocol because they want to be able to just move their assets from one wallet address to another. They want to be able to dilute the value of their assets by spreading it across multiple different wallets without having to, you know, cause any speculation in the community. Um, and then on the liquidity providing side, right? I think that's another big question about like, um, you know, who owns these pools? Where are these pools going? Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's a whole different sort of. No, I really, I really appreciate the transparency of the conversation. And I wanted to ask you also about scalability because this brings it back to Manta in that we know that with the development of the technology for Polkadot, that scalability is definitely designed 
in in the core uh, i guess value proposition of the technology it's one of the reasons why it will be successful in the future and why arguably there will be more of a seamless experience for users because they won't need to know about the blockchain itself but have that uh, set very very um, high level of throughput and also have that you know very seamless experience when it comes to i guess the the transaction experience so in that sense you know, we know now that some of the issues with Ethereum, for example, really lend themselves to the institutional, you know, those big transactions, but for the little guys, sometimes it can become quite expensive. And then we've seen the likes, for example, of Secret Network Emerge. I'm sure you would know of them. Um, but again, are you interview? Right, exactly. And when we were discussing that, we were talking about, I guess, siloed uh, or enclosed networks and obviously they're doing amazing work but going one step beyond that but in the context of scalability because they're addressing that as well in their own way so how do we discuss and ext extrapolate scalability and go one step beyond where we are now for Manta to showcase that they are, i guess leading the way yeah so i guess that that kind of goes back to the idea of plug and play you know, if we're, if we're building plug and play, definitely scalability, speed, performance is extremely important. And as you've alluded to, right, the, the Ethereum platform, the network, and building decentralized applications on top of that can be a potential bottleneck. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's the consensus protocol, which is proof of, proof of work, um, or it's the EVM itself. And so because we're building all of our privacy functionality as part of our layer one and integrating it there, right? We essentially eliminate the need for the, the virtual machine layer. So instead of needing the EVM and running a DAP on top of that, right? It all runs on that core infrastructure. And by doing that, we release a lot of the compute power that we can then readjust back to the actual privacy layer. Um, whereas on the EVM, not only are you sharing potential compute power with other applications, but the EVM itself takes up a lot of that compute power. And so all of that just, I guess, layman's term means that there's, there's limitations on the compute capacity, which means that there's limitations on the potential scalability. Exactly. Uh, and then the consensus protocol itself, right? It's, um, because proof of work is known to be slow, whether that is a feature or a bug is, you know, still up for a community to debate and we're not here to solve that. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that it results in slower transactions, um, larger mempools and uh, higher gas fees. And so that's just something that, you know, we're, we're definitely keeping an eye on with Ethereum and, you know, excited to see Ethereum 2.0. Uh, but until that time, right, right now we're, we're seeing it and users are feeling it. Um, yeah. So by taking it off that layer and putting it through our own chain as a layer one, right, where we're circumventing and not necessarily needing the proof of work consensus protocol anymore, which also adds more scalability and performance to our network. Yes. And that's the big question I want to ask you. So when we talk, I mean, rehash the very age old adage, I guess, of the trilemma. We've heard that all the way back in 2017. How are you going to address the security? Because we know definitely through the empirical assessment of code and design that uh, proof of work does offer a very secure model, uh, albeit with trade-offs, as you alluded to with the, with the, the scalability aspect. How are you going to make sure you have equal, if not better security within the network, within the blockchain layer one that you have, and also in the broader context of layer zero architecture where you're plug and playing with other uh, different blockchains? Yeah, so I think, I think that question is as much for us as it is for, the, uh, for Polkadot. Right, because a lot of the a lot of the projects on the the Polkadot uh, ecosystem are relying on Polkadot security as well, right? Uh, whether it's the relay chain layer, um, right, the XM, XCMP uh, messaging. Um, so I I don't have a specific answer to that, only because I'm more on the the, the operation side. But I think that probably we could follow up with uh, one of our technical co-founders on that question. Yeah, no problem. I actually asked this with it to Equilibrium yesterday. And what was interesting also, Kenny, is that the response was about audits, about the processes, about the relay chain and how they do ensure their own security. And I think that's going to be important throughout your engagement with Polkadot as well, knowing you have that peace of mind that they do have rigorous processes for their own, I guess, uh, insurance product, um, for their uh, their, their relay chain in that it is highly secure 
um, and is public about that as well through the way in which they have engaged third parties. Um, but let's go back again to you, team, tech, token. They're the three teams I always look for when I'm looking for the quality. And I've always said this to you when we've been catching up, I do think you are a legit team. Um, so let's explain that, you know, let, let me, you know, ask you why, um, you know, would it be the case that you're a legit team? How can you, you know, represent that? Um, how can you evidence that? How can you, I guess, sell that to us with proof? Yeah. So I guess a little bit of team background. Um, you know, I, I'll put myself last because I'm probably the least impressive here, but I have uh, a team of four co-founders, including myself or Manta Network has a team of four co-founders, um, two on the technical side and two on the business strategy side. So I'm on the business strategy side. Uh, on the technical side, we have Shumo and Jen Fei. They both used to work at Algorand, one as a researcher and one as a cryptographer. Um, Shumo, who is our CEO right now, is also a professor at UCSD. And he has a PhD in computer science, has published 10 peer-reviewed papers um, I've forgotten exactly which publications, but he has a focus on cryptography and he teaches uh, blockchain and cryptography at UCSB. Um, and then on the other hand, we have Jim Fei, who's our CTO. Uh, he has extremely deep experience in the cryptography space. His papers, 30, um, yeah, 30 papers uh, published specifically within the cryptography ecosystem in top tier publications there. And he's also the uh, co-author of the BLS signature standard. Um, and then on the, uh, I guess, business strategy side, we have myself and Victor. Uh, Victor is, uh, yeah, I guess is, uh, uh, or was uh, at Harvard. He received his master's degree in economics. Uh, he's focused more so on our token economics and investment strategy. Um, and he also was uh, an investor in this space for quite a bit. This is actually his first full-time project. Um, but he's been traditionally a very hands-on investor. He's built out a lot of more of the token economics side for a lot of projects in the past. Uh, I believe he was the first U.S. Binance angel as well. Um, okay. All right, then, well, let me jump in there. So you've got all yeah. the, the biz dev side. I mean, that just with Victor alone, that's really substantial. Knowing he's also been one of the first Binance angels. And me personally knowing how powerful that can be, having known some others, that's really significant. But he also has that crypto savvy, that unique sort of knowledge of the crypto systems, which does differ to legacy, uh, I guess, business as well. But then let's go back to what you first explained, and that is that very deep um, crypto the, the team of who have true um, cryptographic knowledge, you know, that can sort of work on code. So how is the, the, these, are these team members translating into full-time activity? Are they engaged with you now full-time or what's the nature of this? Because I, I would, I'm sure you'd know back in 2017, 18, even sometimes 19, some people were hired for their name, for their, I guess, prestige. And I just want to get past that. I want to really push you on this and see how we can explore what these members are doing, how they do it, essentially how transparent is the code, for example, as well? Yeah, the, the code is fully transparent on our GitHub. Um, I don't know if the latest build is already up there or not, but all of our team members are full-time. Um, so Shumo, Fei, Victor, and I, we're full-time on this project. Okay, well, that gives us some peace of mind there. Great to know that you've sort of captured all different facets of team needs as well, because there's just no way that a crypto team can work or a blockchain team if you don't have that business biz savvy as well. And with Victor, you're in good hands there. Now, the tokenomics, I was going to get to this later, but you you mentioned it. So let's discuss, you know, the kinds of things that you'd be talking about with Victor. As he's using all of experience before, how does he go about trying to design, you know, a very robust and very high quality tokenomic model? Yeah. So, um, man, I wish he was here to explain it because I'm sure he'll be able to explain it much better than I can. I can next time. Just... <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, so we have two main functionalities of our token. One is the utility aspect and the other one, which is kind of like an auxiliary component is the governance aspect. Uh, but that being said, right, like governance is really important for us because we do want this to be a very community focused project. Um, we've already built, or after we deployed our prototype onto GitHub, uh, we actually built a video walkthrough just to teach the community how to deploy it themselves. And so they can start kind of picking apart at it. Um, but that being said, right, because we're also kind of thinking about fees, new tokens, token pairings, 
um, then definitely having the community votes in there would be very important to us. The utility aspect of it, um, we are building a deflationary token. So the total supply of this token is 1 billion. So 1 billion Manta tokens. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I kind of mentioned a few seconds ago, um, there, are, there are fees built into the network. So we go through a process called minting to create private tokens. So what you would do, for example, is you would bring 10 tokens or you would deposit 10 uh, dots and we would mint you 10 private dot, which has the corresponding peg to the original dot. And then you have your own private wallet address uh, through a UTXO model. So there are mm -hmm. burner addresses and you can send to myself or send to me. You can send to uh, your friends, right? Like no one knows who you're sending to. No one sees, them. for example, you sent me two dot. I would see the two dot. And at any point in time, I can send that to anyone else too, or I can withdraw to the original public dot. And that's called redeeming. So we have minting to the private token, redeeming back to the public token. Those two points each take a 0.1% transaction fee for now, right? The community right. can change that in the future. Um, those fees are collected and put into what we call a redemption pool. And so that pool actually gives uh, fees back to Manta token holders. But in order to receive uh, your allocation in the pool as a Manta token holder, you have to do what we call a, a burn, or I guess we don't call it. We didn't invent that. But mm -hmm. um, the idea is that you deposit Manta tokens in a one-way address, and then you're able to receive the fees back. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of the deflationary aspect of the token itself. Yes, and I'm sure you'd appreciate when speculators hear that explanation in the context of burn, in the context of deflation, that supply is going to drop you know, we would speculate on that design simply because of the way in which this is this model is designed. We've seen also very successful burn designs in the past or those in which where essentially the, the supply initially is quite high, but it's utilized as fuel for an ecosystem. Now that ratio you talked about, is that a one for one swap essentially, or is that a one for one when, for example, someone wants to mint, for example, and make that transition from the, their to that token to the Manta token in the way in which you can essentially engage in the minting process. Is that how it works? Um, I think there might be a little confusion. So the first part, the minting part is purely for changing into a private token for transaction. Okay. Um, the burning part, you burn the Manta token. But the Manta token is not necessarily private. You can privatize the Manta token by, you know, doing the whole minting process. Uh, but by default, the Manta token is actually not private. Um, but the, when you burn, you have to burn Manta token. You can't just bring your own token to burn. Does Got that it. make sense? My it makes sense. So essentially, the, the supply is going to d decline over time, hence the deflationary aspect. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay, so for a speculator, they're going to like that. Let's be real about that. When they're thinking of price, you can't you know, just respond, but that's just the logic I'm hearing there. Um, now let's explain, explain this a bit more now. The token itself, what other facts should we know with regard to the way in which it's designed? Just the basic facts, and I'll sp speak with Victor later in detail, hopefully. But when it comes to, for example, those investors, you know, that initially invested in the system, they would have been aware of token, the tokenomic design, there would have been pictures, there would have been discussions. So do you lock up the parties who are investing for the long term um, when it comes to investment, you know, considering there are tokens involved right from the outset? Um, more importantly, with regard to the distribution, how is that model designed so that people know exactly where and how you spend uh, your money, the money or the all allocate the token out for the prosperity of this team for the long term? I mean, there's so many different facets, obviously, but if you just want to touch on the things you know or you're comfortable with, with regard to us understanding not just the token or the tokenomics, but also the broader model that you guys created. Sure, yeah, I think at a high level, um, the features that are mentioned are the primary features of the token that we'll be releasing with. Um, there also is a rebate uh, system because as part of our, as part of our uh, network, we're also releasing our own sort of suite of products and services, uh, including Manta Pay, which is the private transacting, and Manta Swap, which is our private AMM DEX. Mm -hmm. um, and so as part of the DEX, right, there's swap fees, much like you'd see in like a Uniswap or Sushi Swap, 0.3% uh, of which uh, point or 80% of that 0.3%. 
goes back to liquidity providers for liquidity providing incentives. And then the remaining 20% goes back to Manta token holders as rebate uh, when they do the swap. Uh, so there's that functionality as well. Um, but right, like we still have a little bit of time to go. We haven't generated our tokens yet. So there's still, you know, I guess opportunity, uh, to make improvements to that model. And we do want to do some economic auditing of our, uh, of our proposal, uh, before we finalize all that. So you're just kind of, you're hearing everything a bit early. Got it. Um, well, I appreciate that transparency because everyone's <laughs> been looking at this, you know, as well. And we're all assuming, you know, that there are these token models on the, on the, on the boardroom, you know, table where you're, you know, exploring this and really finalizing this. Um, obviously there are investors that have come in though, you know, you've raised some capital. So we could talk about that because clearly that would, I would assume that's not just an equity or that would not be necessarily an equity. I mean, you can clarify this for us, but I would assume that would involve also, you know, discussions about how they invest and what that means and how that's related to the token itself. Yeah. So, um, there is, so there is a token lockup for all the investors. Uh, and in fact, there's token lockup for everyone, um, including the team and, and the team has the longest token lockup. And, um, the idea here is that we, we wanted to make, uh, the investments as fair as possible. No one gets favorable terms in this case. Right. So, um, I guess, yeah, anything specific about that? Well, I think that's the thing. I think a lot of people want to hear that, you know, that there are, is not preferential treatment, that things are treated, you know, in a very transparent way as well, and that there are those key lockups because, once again, that is an important trust element of the people involved, Rather, even though we all support trustlessness because we want to make sure that they are there for the long term. So in the processes also of trying to, I guess, have support, as we know that you've raised now, well, did you find that there was a real variation of different people coming to you, you know, and still probably now where there's a different agenda and how did you differentiate to the point where you took on certain and accepted the support of certain parties? I'm really interested to hear that because we want to hear more of this long-term agenda from teams, obviously, as we progress forward in the industry. So how did you uh, find parties that would align with that expectation? And, you know, obviously that was the bottom line for you long-term or nothing, I would assume. Um, I mean, I think it's more of an art than a science for that, right? And I wish I could tell you this like foolproof method of figuring it all out. Um, but I, I think, you know, things move so quickly in the crypto space that is sometimes you know, you, you don't figure it out. You just got to figure it out on the fly. Um, and so from our perspective, one of the, I think one of the things that Victor did really well, um, amongst many things that he did really well uh, during the investment is that we, we focused and made sure that no single entity uh, could have any significant stake in the project. Uh, and so, you know, it's, should it turn out that any single entity did or was, mm. you know, yeah, then it, it, it wouldn't make a, a mm. an impact on, you know, what we're building and put our community at risk or anything. Uh, and so we did a good job of doing that. And I think now, and, and on top of that, right, as I mentioned, everyone gets the same sort of um, lockup period, everyone gets the same terms. And so even if people ask for different terms, it's just not something that we're offering. And yeah. these are all set by, you know, our, our agreement with the lead investors of each round. And I really um, appreciate the sort of strong stance you've, you've taken on that and the transparent one. I mean, some teams just don't do that. Some are a non and we don't even, we can't even ask those questions to those parties, which is interesting. So let's bring it back, I guess, the tech now, because I think you've really clarified that the aspect of transparency with regard to the lockup and the, the investors. Um, but the, you, the whole utility architecture, you know, there's so many different facets to this. And I think that's important when it comes to compliance regulation and the future potential of this globally. Fundamentally a utility token, but then you also nuance the importance and imperative governance. Do you want to just touch on a few of these things with regard to DeFi, true decentralization as you progress as well, because that model and that utility token should reflect that. Um, yes, I would love to. I, I'd also like to get a little bit more specific on your question. So, I, I, so for example, with governance, for example, with voting. Now, we know that that's a key part of the DeFi movement because it allows people to have direct input 
in an involvement in engagement with regard to uh, the robustness, the, pro the prospect, the, the prosperity and the future of, of the ecosystem itself of Mensa. And so built into utility, having governance there, it, it really raises the bar, you know, for access and DeFi and input from the people. And so the question, I guess, is uh, how you can articulate the value of governance, but built into a utility token. A lot of people confuse the two and assume there are such things as governance tokens that separate, but you are not that. You are a utility token by design. And so I guess it's really touching on the value of governance related to DeFi and how it moves out to support DeFi as a movement. Yeah, so I guess, you know, one of the things that I kind of picked up from what you just said was like some projects have potentially more than one single token, right? There, there is uh, potentially a different uh, governance token as well. And, but we are, we are just kind of one token that has both features. Exactly. Uh, and why we decided to do that is because we do want to make sure that the community input is specifically tied into the value of the project, which means that, you know, if, if one day the community votes on something and for one reason or another, that vote doesn't actually get implemented, right? That can impact the actual token itself because that the governance feature is built right into there. And so the question becomes like, what's the value if the community vote doesn't even matter? And so we definitely want to make sure that that's emphasized. And by pegging the value of the project to the community, because the community is really a critical part, then, then I think we can, we can all align on that same motivation to make sure that the, the, the governance, the community aspect is actually, is actually delivered on. Yeah, Does that, that makes, make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's good to know that that's built in once again, because people definitely want to have more of that input and involvement directly with networks like Manta. Um, what about the key products and the key features that you, you alluded to some of them, for example? Um, what do you think are the standouts that we need to know about right now with regard to the products, the offerings that are built on the protocol itself? Because you're not just the protocol, the protocol, platform, full service, full stack coming. So what are the ones that excite you the most and what do we need to know about them? Yeah, so uh, Manta Pay is the first one coming out. We've already got a functional prototype of that. We've actually submitted uh, that to the Web3 Foundation Open Grants as part of our first milestone. So we delivered on that. We're really excited. And the really cool part about Manta Pay is that you know you have bring your own token, as I mentioned before. Uh, you're just you're you don't have to use Manta tokens. In fact, you know, like I said, our tokens aren't private by default. You have to mint it just like any other token. Mm -hmm. And so you know, we we definitely want to see the community start testing that out. Um, I think especially with the launch of parachains and that native interoperability across parachains, right? Like immediately users will start being able to access privatized versions of various different parachain project tokens uh, and being able to transact that. Uh, I, I think that's going to be pretty cool for the Polkadot ecosystem. Absolutely. And then you also have the DEX as well. Um, one of your first major projects is with the AMM as well, the Automated Market Maker. Uh, is, that, is that the term of it? Is that right? Yeah. 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 So, so it is AMM based. Yeah. Yeah, and that's Sorry? the man, that's the Manta swap essentially. Is that right? Yes, yes, it okay. is. And then, um, what about wallets? So I noticed in the readings that there was also other products like that that are going to be set up. Is that correct as well? Um, kind of. We do want to be integrated with wallets, but we also understand that being a wallet service is in itself its own project. And so, you know, will Manta Network come out with its own wallet? Um, potentially a very rudimentary version just to get it started, mm -hmm. um, right? As we start working with different wallet services products, uh, there is a point in time where potentially we would need to build something very simple ourselves for our users to get started immediately. Uh, but the goal in the future, um, kind of looking more towards like the commodity aspect of it, is to be able to integrate into Polkadot compatible wallets, parachain asset compatible wallets, and just uh, allow people to privatize their assets straight from there, right? Where, where Manta as that privacy layer doesn't even have to, you know, be apparent to the user. They can just go into their wallet, look at their assets and click on which ones they want to privatize, however many uh, or whatever percentage of those assets they want private and just mm. transact directly through that. Mm. Uh, so 
I guess that's, that's to say you know, a lot of partnerships. <laughs> and, and that's what, yeah, I mean, that's what I wanted to talk to you about as well is those integrations and partnerships that are real. You're going to have so many, I can see that now, perhaps even several we don't even know, including yourselves, because there's so much potential. But that'll start probably with Polkadot, I would imagine, is that right? Where you'll forge more important partnerships that are going to essentially bridge out and, and utilise the plug and play potential of the technology. But also, like you said, you know, there's going to be key startups like Wallets not just even in Polkadot, but perhaps even beyond that, that are all going to start to interact potentially with your technology and your own layer one systems so that the privacy protocol can start to interact properly. Yep, that's the goal. That's the goal. So give us some names, Kenny, come on. So what's happening right now, you're the co-founder. Some of the, those integrations you would know, they're coming in the future, I would imagine, in a list of uh, announcements. But what can you tell us? Are you talking with Plasms? Are you talking with your Carlas? I mean, who are you talking to right now in the Polkadot ecosystem to really start to tinker with privacy? Yeah, so um, I, I guess I don't want to pre-announce things, right? I definitely want to make sure that um, you know, it's worth its weight in gold once we do make the announcement. So I won't drop any names, mm -hmm. um, but I will say that we are getting a lot of interest from the ecosystem and we are very interested in working with a lot of projects in the ecosystem uh, around building that sort of interoperability and actually privatizing tokens. We are doing um, these sorts of projects right now. Uh, we're running tests and we will be hopefully making announcements about it soon. We're really excited about that. <laughs> okay, not Sorry, hopefully. Um, you know, I can read between the lines, so not hopefully. There's more coming, I can tell that. What about the, the likes of, for example, the, the initial stack, you know, that really put forward the narrative of DeFi in Ethereum, you know, the compounds, the Aves, the synthetics and so forth. Um, are there, you know, is there potential integrations with, we talked about the bridges before, once they're established, do you think that that's a viable option as well to embed privacy you know, across the board, across the, I guess, the divide, across the crypto chasm and, and start to facilitate in that respect? Yeah, um, definitely. I, I, I think right now it's a little bit premature for us to really say anything. I mean, it's all conceptual on our end, right? Very high level conceptual. It's definitely one of the goals that we want to reach out for, but um, no details specific right now because we do want to focus on parachains. Yes. But that being said, um, we do have a lot of interesting conversations outside of the Polkadot ecosystem right now. Of, like what? Uh, like what? Uh, like what, Kenny? I mean, the reason I ask is because, you know, we know that Carla's talking to Compound. There's a lot of reciprocal value there, and they're certainly tinkering more than that, actually, and proving the reciprocal value in terms of tech bridges. So, you know, are you talking with the likes of Compound, for example? I mean, are you talking with some of these heavy ones? No. Okay. Um, what I can say is no, we're not currently talking with Compound, um, but I can't really give details of exactly who we're talking to <laughs> and about what. Okay. All right. That's that's safe. Now, what about enterprise? Now, one of the things we did talk about pre-interview last time was that logically, because of the privacy, it opens up every door. And I'm talking about the difference between the anonymity, which was the problem actually for a lot of enterprise, and now they have privacy protocols that really make it possible to protect their clients, can protect their own consumers. And rightly so in their own silos, opening up though in the context of public and permissionless design. So what about enterprise? What's the potential there to break free from some of those problems we've seen in the past and enter into the realm of public permissionless business? Oh man, um, what are some of the possibilities? Uh, mm. A lot of possibilities. <laughs> well, what, what specifically is happening there with regard to Manta? <laughs> Oh, with us uh, in the short term, we, I, I mean, I, I don't think we're doing anything in the short term that's specifically uh, more on the traditional enterprise side. Um, okay. Like I mentioned, we're more so focused on the, the parachains right now. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going a bit fast, but I wanted to touch on this because surely, you know, I'd love to hear from the co-founder that, that everything you're building lends itself to the future alignment of enterprise and for the private sector. So the CD5 meets the D5 you know, in your sense. So just give us a bit of a, 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 like a hint of what you think could happen pragmatically. You know, if everything plays out in the roadmap of blockchain and even in your own, is it likely at some point we're going to see that the enterprise sectors come in, the institutional thus in, in, in concert with the, the enterprise sector start to utilize something like Mentor? Um, yes. So I guess two parts of that question, do we see them coming into 
public permissionless blockchains? And the answer is yes there. Um, I mean, we already see Tesla doing this, right? Uh, the first announcement they made was just kind of holding Bitcoin assets on their balance sheet. And then the next announcement they made is, hey, we're going to start taking payment in Bitcoin now. And a lot of these sort of, I guess, traditional CFI institutions that in 2017 were a little bit hesitant about uh, blockchain projects, uh, Bitcoin, uh, are now starting to accept it as a form of payment as well. And so we are seeing this sort of migration towards acceptance um, and I, I think that that's going to happen a lot more on the consumer level. Uh, Tesla announced their balance sheet. I, I know a lot of Chinese pro or Chinese companies are now announcing their balance sheet assets as well for Bitcoin. I think the latest one was Meitu. Um, it's like the this like face beautifying app in China. Uh, they're, they're huge, but it <laughs> doesn't sound like it from the way I describe it, but that's because I'm selling them short. Right. Um, but they're also getting uh, quite a few Bitcoin assets on their balance sheet. And, you know, the transaction just based on Tesla's pattern should be next on, on the roadmap. And so, you know, on, on the question of do we see uh, centralized finance, uh, traditional consumer goods coming into the public permissionless blockchain space? Uh, yes, I do think that Bitcoin is the gateway. Um, but I mean, much like we've seen in the consumer side pattern, Bitcoin has been the gateway, but now we have this explosion of an entire ecosystem of, uh, a lot of different other networks that people are starting to play with. People are starting to deploy projects on. Mm. Um, and then the other question is, you know, what is Manta's role in that? What is any privacy projects role in that? I think, um, going back to, you know, consumer data and making sure that consumer data is uh, not unethically obtained and exploited, a privacy layer is going to be an extremely vital part of that entire interaction between consumer and businesses. Um, ideally, it will be Manta. But, you know, even if it's not Manta, it does imply that there needs to be some type of solution there. Will yeah. every single company, every single project be building their own privacy solution? That just... It just sounds like a headache, an unscalable headache. It's like when you see you know, uh, tech teams in hospitals because hospitals now have to worry about da patient data, digital patient data, right? But the hospital's value proposition isn't patient or, or digitizing patient data. It's to provide healthcare, right? So like, do, do, should all hospitals need to build everything from the ground up or can they use cloud services like Google and Amazon and Microsoft to facilitate the tech side of their operations, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're definitely sitting in the sweet spot of being able to facilitate the privacy side of different project operations. Um, and so, yes. so essentially, uh, essentially you become that one-stop shop for, you know, various parties, whether that be other blockchains, whether that be potentially in the future at the private sector enterprise, trying to capitalize on the blockchain. It makes no sense that they would reinvent the wheel at the layer one, especially considering how much time and effort and money it does take. Um, it's logical that they want to be economical and efficient. And to do that would be to plug and play, essentially, just like we're seeing now with the beginnings of Manta with Polkadot as evidence that this can be done. So it's really exciting to see that there's these doors opening up. And if we move across to Secret, Secret Network, for example, we know, for example, they've moved in that direction. We know they have their own layer one design as well but they haven't plugged into a layer zero. And that's, I know, I'm not trying to just suggest competition. There's ample room for parties like Secret to exist, Secret Network to exist in this space, but you are Manta Network. You have that, uh, I guess, that one up in terms of the, the association with the layer zero, you know, the robust underpinning architecture that helps all the layer ones. So is that one of your key advantages? And do you want to just touch on that for a moment? Is there anyone else in the space doing this kind of thing where they're engaging with the layer zero? I don't know. Um, that's a really good question. So I, I don't think we have any direct competitors in this space. Um, I mean, there are other projects that are focused on privacy, but I guess, you know, the, the question is like privacy of what? Um, for example, Fala Network, right? They're also in uh, the Polkadot space, right? Building on Substrate and also going to for a pair chain. They are TEE based. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think that was like what uh, Secret Network used to be, right? Back when it was Enigma. I think Enigma was also TEE. That's right. But um, that's the privacy of the computation itself. 
And so that's like running the decentralized applications in a confidential manner. Um, but that means the transaction layer is still open for, you know, uh, potential privacy solutions like us. So, you know, not to set anything in stone, but that that's a potential way for Fala and Manta Network to work together. <laughs> no hint, I'm guessing, but uh, we'll, we'll interesting to see what happens there. Um, now, obviously, it's been really exciting to see the beginnings of Manta. A lot of people still don't know a lot about you. One of the interesting things, I want to go through some of those investors and, and link this to, I guess, the kind of due diligence that you, they've done, you've done. Um, and, and you can also see the alignment of various ecosystems within the space right across DeFi. So Polychain, obviously, re renowned. Um, and has a reputation to reflect their interest in, in Ethereum, the ecosystem, uh, and across the board in major investments, not just in DeFi, but in blockchain. Hypersphere, very much connected with the Polkadot ecosystem, only natural that they're going to be listed in there. And then obviously the list goes on. I'm not going to name everyone, but TRG was an interesting one. Uh, Three Arrows makes sense there. Their positioning in Asia, they often support those, but also they're very much pro DeFi. Multicoin made a lot of sense to me because they're, very, very pro, um, I guess, innovation when it comes to DeFi, when it comes to being in good stead with other VCs. So there's a lot of interconnected sort of nuance here as well. A lot of alliances of, of support with the long-term interest in DeFi. So once again, they've done their homework, you've done your homework. Are you really happy with the investors that you have secured there? I think for the most part, yes. Uh, I think definitely the ones you listed, they've been great. And I mean, even the ones you haven't listed, um, we've, we've had various levels of interaction with each. Uh, a lot of them are, can be, well, I guess there's two types of styles, right? There's one that uh, they're very hands-on. They'll ping you every now and then, see what you need. And then there's the other style of people who know that if you have a question or a problem or something they can help with, you'll come to them. And so we're, we're lucky to have both. Um, but I think in any instance, right, whether it's we come to them or they come to us, uh, I haven't really seen any sort of, um, I guess, examples of any of them not being able to assist us in some manner. So yeah. I think that well, let, let's that. talk about that. So what do they offer beyond the capital? This two twenty one. Oh. We don't we don't care just about capital in the VC space or in the uh, sorry not in the VC in the in the in uh, founder space. You know, I'm assuming because you want more than just the capital. So I meant you know we want that capital plus factor. So we do care about the capital, but it has to be more. So what do you demand? What do you expect from these parties when they and what do they offer? Um, so we have a really clear picture as, I guess, the, the lay public, exactly what kinds of things that they plan on doing as, you know, as fortunate investors, because it is a fortunate opportunity for them, definitely, given that we see the trajectory of many of these tokens, just, you know, some of them go to the moon, some of them move forward rapidly, some of them, you know, have huge support networks behind them as well. And so love to hear from you exactly what's what sort of the inner workings are in the inner discussions with regard to liaising with these parties yeah um i mean the the conversations are endless so i know for example with polychain right uh we're scaling out our team we're um apart from our co-founders we have three others we actually uh just recently onboarded our third person so a total team of seven but we're trying to expand to a team of 10 by the end of this month so by the end of April. Um, and, you know, we, we want to hire top quality talent. We've gotten a lot of applications. How do we sort through this? Who do we look for, right? Um, what are some red flags uh, and what are some great indicators, right? These sort of like hiring strategies. Um, Polychain put us in touch with uh, someone on their team, Aurora. She used to be head of um, HR for Coinbase. A lot of these things, like we don't even know, um, or we didn't think about them as priorities when we were looking for investors, but then they just kind of pop out and they're little fires that you have to put out. But having like this roster of amazing people that we can just call and they just have amazing, either they themselves can help us or they know people who can help us and they put us immediately in touch. It's been like uh, it's been invaluable because it just means the difference between spending 10 days on something or spending two days on something. Right. right? And then like, I, I mean, you know, I tweeted out about um, TRG, right. The, the guy answers 
whether you ping him in the middle of the night or in the morning and you know he responds within 24 hours if he doesn't know he knows someone that knows like yes and exactly <laughs> and i think more people need to know this is that a lot of the representatives of these capital firms and these vcs they do really work hard you know to have that privilege of being part of that early those early rounds and so they have an arsenal they have a whole uh, very replete um, offering of tools, resources, connections. And so as a result, they managed to, I guess, become part of the, the Mensa team in terms of long-term support. So with regard to marketing, for example, that's a tough question because we talked about this earlier. earlier. There's the risk also uh, and the anomaly of those pump and dump scenarios where sometimes you, a marketing, an aggressive marketing team can cause you know, these, these influencer spikes you know, that are price pushing uh, approaches. So how do you circumvent that, but also establish yourselves in the space and become known with quality marketing strategies that are perhaps more organically geared or they're just more in aligned with your position as a long-term startup? Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't, I, I guess I don't know too much about the whole pump and dump stuff. Um, mm. I mean, obviously read articles about it and stuff, but never really, um, I guess, experienced it myself. Um, so I don't know too much about that, but I do know that, um, you know, as I mentioned before, with the investment allocations, everyone has a lockup period and no single person or no single entity has enough to, you know, cause a big splash. Uh, so that's something that we mitigated for at the beginning and, you know, definitely mm. Victor to thank for that. Um, well, what about what about marketers though? I mean, are they going to be involved in in some way, either in allocation or is there an agency or how are you approaching that? Because I really appreciate your transparency about those main investors, but I'm talking more about the marketing trajectory and plan um, forward, so people become more aware of Manta Dow without trying to compromise, you know, the natural progression that should naturally align. That is team tech token all aligns naturally and progressively together so that you can you know emerge as you rightly should um, without compromising any of that uh, and we've seen in the past sometimes really legitimate tokens and legitimate tech and legitimate teams actually do have these very anomalous price moves because some influencers are actually price movers so it's a tough call but you know obviously some of the uh, guest services and offerings and uh, connections of some of the vcs is marketing teams so again, how do you sort of make sure that you protect the integrity of your team? Yeah, that's a good question. On the marketing side, all I can say, not because I'm hiding anything, but just because we haven't really done any marketing yet, um, as you could probably tell, right? Just based on <laughs> our right. activity. That's why we're talking, <laughs> because this is a free interview. Here. <laughs> right, but we are very selective about who we interact with as well. And, you know, not to toot your own horn, Brad, but, you know, that's, I think, you know, talking to you even before this interview and all that stuff, like it just, I feel like it's definitely a very good fit. And so I think one of the things we look for in terms of like who we're aligning with in this space is we want to make sure that the people that we're talking to are able to educate their audience on what we're actually doing and what our value proposition is, what we're providing, right? Because, um, yeah, we don't have a publicly tradable token, right? There's nothing to claim will like, you know, do anything. Mm. Um, but what we can say is that we have a prototype that's functional and, you know, we're working towards our test net in later uh, this quarter. And so those are the things that we're really excited about. And we want a community that's excited about that as well. And uh, so from that perspective, right, finding the people that are excited about the product, the tech, what we're building out and like the difference it's going to make, um, those are people we're looking for right now. Um, Absolutely. And I, and I really appreciate that, mate. And we'll be looking forward to seeing this unfold in terms of the strategy that moves and it could become a, a sort of a third party movement. I'm assuming that will happen. There will be parties that just will grab on as groups in the crypto space and really want to push you forward, whether you like that or not. And that's kind of fun to watch if that I've always said, shill away if something's legit, you know, why not? But when it comes down to the, the facts is that it's ultimately down to the integrity of the tech and the team that really is going to lead this out. So on that, on the final note, I think we should pull it back to privacy, the value proposition of that. And one last comment from you, why privacy matters, why you differentiate from the others and why it matters that we should know about Mentor Network. Um, why privacy matters. It doesn't matter until it does. 
I know that in Secret Network, um, the, the, the interview that you did with Tor, he was talking about squeezing toothpaste, which is a great analogy, right? Because, you know, as soon as you squeeze too much, you can't put it back in the tube. I mean, it's, it's pri privacy is like that. You're going to be, you know, just to give an analogy, you're going to be like 13 and you're going to be on Facebook and you don't have no idea what the consequences of, you know, posting certain things on Facebook will be. And then you're 21 and you're looking back on things that you posted when you're 13 and you cringe, right? There's a whole subreddit of that. <laughs> and so, right. But the, the good thing about, you know, posting on Facebook, well, the good thing is that you get to delete it. Um, but on chain, you can't delete it. I mean, you know, you, you can't exactly. delete it on Facebook either, but on chain, it's like publicly transparent that you can't delete it. Um, and so, you know, there, there are consequences to that. So that's why privacy does matter. And we do see it affecting user behavior. People are, you know, conscious about it, but they aren't really thinking directly at that moment. Like, ah, privacy is so important. They just, they're just doing little behavioral changes, um, creating new wallets, sending funds through centralized exchanges for that sort of obfuscation. But that creates other linkages um, that, you know, we don't have to get into. Mm. Um, and then the second part of the question, sorry. Well, obviously privacy matters. Um, that's important. You've mentioned that. And most importantly, when it comes to the privacy protocol, really it's about just discussing specifically with Manta, what the real potential of this is. What is something that really is a key factor when it comes to you being in the primary position as COO, as co-founder, that is going to help us solidify our support our understanding of why this matters today in terms of pragmatic need uh, applications that need to ha happen DeFi movement i mean there's so many things you could add to this yeah so um why manta network matters it's the plug and play like people want to use privacy on chain they just haven't had an easy way of doing that Right, we we see it with Zcash. Um, a, a very small percentage of Zcash transactions are actually private. Um, and so, on the one hand, you could say that okay, this means people don't care about privacy. Or, but when you look at you know other privacy solutions like um, applications being built on Ethereum, um, Aztec, Tornado Cash, and you see all this heavy volume um, being transacted with that privacy layer. And it paints a totally different picture. And the, the difference really is user experience. Um, and so being able to implement it as quickly, scalably, and easily as possible um, across various projects, we think that's going to make a major impact. And we don't really see anyone focused on building a protocol that just lets everyone else do whatever they're doing on whatever chain they're doing it on. And by the way, if you need that privacy, just like plug it in here through this SDK. Um, we do see projects where people are like, oh, use our network or build on top of us. But we're not asking anyone to build on top of us. We're just asking people to like, you know, reach out when they need us and then don't when they don't. Exactly. And that's the beauty of having your own system, your own layer one. That's going to be the game changer. That's the plug and play model. That's where we're going to see perhaps a whole string of uh, applications, blockchains, integrations unfold. It's going to be exciting to see 221, 222 and beyond that. Honestly, Kenny, to see how the Manta network expands, broadens and starts to be utilised. Now, just one more thing I want to clarify before we go. The speculators will be, I can imagine them all screaming at me right now. And that's with regard to the token you mentioned also, obviously that's an integral part, literally designed and embedded as the core fuel for the whole architecture of Manta. Now, you mentioned also that one of the key members of your team is connected to Binance as an angel, for example, or was initially. So can we rightly expect that this will be something that does emerge on exchanges in the future? Is this something that's gonna be something that's interactive for speculators or is this going to be an in-house design? Is this something that's purely designed for use case and utility inbound as we've explained? Or what is to come in terms of the token roadmap? Um, yeah, so I think it, I can speak with pretty high confidence that it will be on exchanges at some at point. Some point. 
Um, but right. you know, exactly what the date is. I mean, honestly, I'm not hiding anything. We're, we, we, we don't know. We're trying to get to test that out right now. Got it. We'll, and and yeah, I appreciate it. that so much because we've got a, you've got a long roadmap ahead and I thank you for your time. What about launch pads? I just want to get that final comment on you. Um, and maybe perhaps, you know, it's that sly last point question. Um, but it's because obviously we see right now, there's a whole, whole plethora of um, launch pads. There's different kinds of quality emerging. Uh, there's different kinds of levels of KYC, some not, some yes, um, in terms of requisites. What are your thoughts on these? Are you bullish on launch pads? Do you like launch pads? Are you looking in the direction of launch pads in terms of, you know, that narrative of exchange? Or is that something not in the conversation of discussion or possibility uh, for Manta? Um, I think that's just, I think it's not a question for me. I think it's more so for Victor. Honestly, I don't have enough time to look at cryptocurrency investments to really even understand what launch pads are great for. <laughs> so. but, uh, yeah. Well, I really appreciate again the transparency and I'll definitely be hitting up Victor for a conversation to learn more about, you know, his knowledge and expertise when it comes to tokenomic design and yeah. even just his understanding of what's to come with regard to, uh, I guess, the emergence of this utility token in the, the public domain. But for now, Kenny, thank you very much for this very, very long interview. I appreciate it. you've answered every question. You are definitely not given any of the questions beforehand. And I respect you immensely for just coming on and willing to take part in this interview. And for those who'd like to know more, make sure you look below. I will put as many links as I can to allow you to have a fundamental understanding of Manta and make sure you also engage with their social channels as well. So Kenny, how can people go and interact more with the likes of you or with the community and with more importantly with the team? Um, Telegram is the easiest way. So our Telegram community, I'm on there 24 seven. I read everyone's messages. I don't respond to everyone's messages um, only because, you know, a lot of the questions are kind of the same and it's about the token and we don't have a token. But, you know, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm just the anonymous admin on um, mm -hmm. the so maybe maybe just the private one. We've discussed the difference between anonymous and private. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> mate, thank you so much for the time. I'll make sure that there are links below for those social channels. And once again, this was all in the name of education, transparency and information for all of us in the public. We deserve it. We want to have access as early as possible. And we thank the teams that give it to us. And we don't have to pay for that information. So can you thank you for making time for us all today. I sincerely appreciate it. And I'd love to catch up again and do some bite-sized bite chunk uh, analyses of uh, how you're evolving, how you're growing, and look at the key parts of the technology and I guess the overall protocol and platform. But for now, once again, final statement from you and thank you for your time. Thank you, Brad. Um, not really a final statement. I don't know what to say. Oh, I do want to say that I, I didn't mean that as a slight against launch pads or anything. I just, I'm just saying I'm ignorant about launch pads, not saying they don't provide any value. That's okay. That's a nice save. I'm sure they appreciate that. <laughs> Well, Kenny, thank you again for your time, mate. You are the COO, you are a co-founder. I wish you all the very best and, and how you evolve. Clearly there's big things to come. And most importantly, it's not about that FOMO, it's about the true trajectory of a legitimate entity, a legitimate startup trying to make difference and make headway when it comes to privacy, preserving that privacy via a legitimate layer one protocol so we can start to plug and play seriously in bigger ecosystems and enfranchise ease of use for them as well. This is all about you know negotiating you know, quality on the blockchain, making sure there's reciprocity of value. And right now you are the go-to when it comes to the Polkadot.eco for privacy. And I'm really excited to see how this is going to evolve in the parachain arena. So stay tuned and we'll definitely catch up soon, Kenny, and take care. Thank you, Brad. Really appreciated it.